It's my absolute pleasure today to be speaking to Tim LaSalle, um, uh, someone who uh, I think, you know, one of the, like, the, the, the central words for me about Tim is gravitas. Um, he just has <laughs> gravitas. <laughs> And uh, it's a totally uh, ineffable thing, but when you're in the presence of it, you know it. And so it's a real honor today, Tim, to speak to you about your work and, you know, of course, some of the um, really exciting details and, and numbers and specifics. But I really wanted to start with, with you and who you are. You've had such an amazing life. You've done so many wonderful things. Um, you've got such perspective. And I think that would... Um, <clears throat> um, be valuable at the beginning of this conversation to just sort of let everyone, you know, have a glimpse into your perspective and perhaps some of the insights that have come to you through your process. So I'd like to just turn it over to you now to turn this out, the gentleman. <laughs> Dan, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be with all of you today. You know, I've been blessed dramatically in my life with regard to opportunity to learn if, if I chose to take those opportunities. And in many cases, uh, I was either gently nudged or sometimes booted into them, but often was able to choose um, to take an opportunity to grow and learn. I grew up on a conventional farm in the Central Valley of California um, and majored in agriculture in, in, at the university, went on to grad school, stayed in that flow, ended up being a professor for a dozen years at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I was teaching high input intensive agriculture uh, I was steeped in it, but I began to travel the world and I began to see in those times. When, that, what is that? Yeah. Give, us a, give us a decade here, just for context. Well, that was, I began to travel in like in 76 and I began, and the first time I was in China was in the early 80s where everybody was still on a bicycle. But yeah. what I saw progress rapidly around the globe is as populations increased, the degradation of our planet was occurring at a fairly fast pace. I mean, in my lifetime, I'm watching it if we observe and pay attention. And it made me begin to question more deeply what we were doing in agriculture and ask questions about sustainability, which is now I would say an obsolete word. We've overshot, no, no, no need to even use that anymore. And I began, I, I ran across Roland Bunch in Honduras years ago and he was doing what is called regenerative agriculture today, but we didn't term it that back then. Um, even though Bob Rodale had started to use a, a phrase like that um, with regard to what he was seeing in Africa. And that began to flip in my mind. It was a paradigm shift that I was open to because I understood the degradation. I ended up eventually running the Savory Center for Holistic Management um, as I left the university and the California Agriculture Leadership Program. And really to stop the spread of deserts, I, I ended up then being the first CEO at Rodale Institute, which moved me into a more organic consciousness. But I continued to see the challenges that such things as organic presented with regard to continued degradation of soil in many cases. And so uh, Howard Buffett and I struck up a relationship and, and there are some things we really don't agree upon and some things we deeply agreed upon. And that had to do with, in Africa, the idea of GMOs and, and fertilizers were a non-starter. And we had to do the work from the standpoint of figuring out how to create productive systems. Uh, and I sort of set the constructs myself with no outside inputs um, and how do you create a biological system that really can function to feed really uh, people who are food insecure as well as climate. So let me just say, I, I had, had posited in, in um, and, and I think your father had quoted this in a paper that he wrote is that in 2007 when I was at Rodale, we could capture all of the atmospheric carbon through soil. Uh, and that was based on some research done by USDA on the Rodale Institute farm. Uh, and it was based on compost. But that's just taking a number of a ton of carbon per hectare, you know, per year. And if you multiply it by the 1.87 billion uh, hectares of farmland, uh, you could start to draw down uh, instead of just um, reduce. Problematically is that's an over-optimistic statement in many ways, which we can get into. But the point is, 
is if we shift a focus and compost isn't the way to do it rapidly. And that yeah. I think is an important thing yeah. we can talk about today. But moving to Africa, um, Howard Buffett provided me in Northern South Africa. He said, Tim, I have for you some of the best worst soils you can farm. And it was a chance to explore things with regard to no tilling and no outside inputs because smallholder farmers don't have the money anyway. And it forced me into a biological world of how you can produce crops looking at the biological realm to source, to create, to transport, to free up, to liberate the nutrients for the plant. And at the same time, dumping through the biological life, carbon into the soil for water, holding capacity for plant health, et cetera, et cetera. And that then made me realize we need to change the world's agriculture. This is a paradigm shift going from input consciousness to biological living soil. And, and that meant we have to reach academia again. We have to reach the scientific community again. We have to reach policy people again. And unfortunately, paradigms usually take 100 years to make that shift. And we didn't have 100 years. Regardless, Dr. Cindy Daly and I uh, got together and Cindy at Chico State, we created the Center for Regenerative Agriculture. We have some powerful new data that's come out uh, that I will share with you today that really supports the idea of what biology can do, what this new paradigm could do for all of us on this planet. And that's sort of my trajectory. Um, I came home not to retire, you know, a country club and golf clubs are not in my future. I just can't do that. Uh, when we have what's going on on the planet daily, um, you know, our continued sort of lifestyles that are taking us to an end point, not a future. But yet we have a pathway for a future if we choose to take it. And I, I hope to share some of those data points today, Dan. So that's, that's my trajectory. It's still growing. I am still yeah. learning uh, every day. And uh, we hope that we can contribute not to the discourse, but to the change in how we understand soils and the future of humanity and all species on Earth. Yeah, so I mean, you, you, you went through so much so fast, you know, um, Savory, Rodale, uh, <laughs> Roland Bunch, um, you know, I mean, I guess we can go lots of lots of places here. I met you, I, I, we were just discussing, I think, in 2017 at, in uh, Half Moon Bay, and we were part of this conversation about, at the beginning of the regenerative word um, and talk, people are talking about labels and certifications and objectives and strategies, and I remember finding common cause with you in the room, you know, people were talking about, you know, 400 should be the target, or you know, slow it down or whatever. Like, no, 280, 280. <laughs> yeah, I did that. You're right. I did that. <laughs> yeah. And, and the was, reason is, is there was no proof. There is no proof for even a 350. There yeah. is no proof that we can, so they, they're always saying two degrees Celsius. That's the maximum. Yeah. Well, we're finding out at one degree Celsius, we're in dire straits in it's California. Not about the average temperature. It's about the ecosystem function, which is about the soil it carbon. Is think and all which, this kind of stuff which yeah. the scientists or a lot of the conversations have never been been focused where you just said dan and it comes to a point that i remember agricultural scientists on the east coast when i was talking at stone barns from cornell saying well the great thing about climate change is those of us in new york will be growing georgia peaches and i wanted to pull my hair out and go <laughs> you don't you can't be saying that as a scientist that's an absurdity to think about that and I remember an Oregon State person once saying when I was out in Oregon talking about, well, we're going to be growing California varietals of wine soon. Absurdities, because we're going to get early spring warmings and then a late freeze and just destroy all your fruit or all your all, all your. And the foundational point is it's not like it just sort of gets warmer. You get these heat domes where you get these desertification effects yep. and the weather's shifted. Yep. And there's, you know, but really has to do with the water cycle with all the Baltiana stuff about the the critical importance of, of cooling through water. I mean, we have to separate these conversations. Carbon is critically important as part of a cycle, but as far as temperature is concerned, it's really the water that facilitates that. So, I mean, it's not about, you know, whatever it is, tons per acre or, or, or offsets or things like that. It's really about the biological system functioning. So 
I mean, and for those who don't know the shorthand, we were saying 410 and, and <laughs> 350 and 280. Those are references to the, you know, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And I think it's prior to uh, what 1750, the, the um, you know, industrial revolution, the, the CO2 in the atmosphere is at 280 parts per million. Um, there's an organization called 350.org, which got started when the, it was only at 375 <laughs> or something. And now we're at 415, 415 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the story has been that it's the carbon that is the climate warming gas. But really, you know, from the, everything that Walter has been doing, Walter, again, again, the, you know, it's the water vapor, which actually facilitates that heating to a large degree. But really, we're not worried about, like, naming exactly what the cause of the heating is, or we shouldn't be. We should be worried about facilitating the cause of the cooling. Um, that's right. And so that's where the whole water cycle insight comes in, but you need the carbon in the soil for that water cycle pump to work. And so maybe let's just jump to it right now. I mean, when we met, you were still working to get set up the, the, the um, Chico State within the bag, you know, department and division. And, um, you know, I've been a, a cheerleader and supporter and, and an ally and partner now with you since, you know, since then, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to say, um, but you were taking what was then, you know, um, work from David Johnson, New Mexico State, saying, wow, looks like we can sequester an amazing amount of carbon. And people are like, no, you can't. And so you said, let's, <laughs> let's, let's figure it out. Let's see. So you've been doing that for a couple of years now. And that's what, I mean, that's the sort of the headline of this conversation. We can get that over with. But what are those numbers? And what, you know, what can you do math on, you said, whatever it is, 1.x, um, you know, billion hectares of ag land. Give us, give us we, we, we could do we could do math, but uh, part of that is you know is is a, a speculative piece. Let me I'll, let me just show you some numbers right now. I mean, speculation from the standpoint that that is it. I um, I think I'm a co-host, so I think I can share a screen. You want to run a few slides right now? Yeah, let me just uh, I'll give you a slide that will show you okay. a little bit of this. So what we Cindy and I, and, and, and now a number of the professors there at Chico set out to do was to study the people that were succeeding wildly. And, and so, you know, here we are from the perspective of saying, Breton Lal and, and uh, you know, Soil Carbon Institutes, et cetera, et cetera, we're talking, well, we could capture uh, one and a half tons at the maximum of carbon per hectare per year. Where we're finding this to be so different is, you know, Gabe Brown was, if you look at his numbers, is 11.6. We're working with Russell Hedrick, a little bit of North Carolina, where he's eight and a half, and David Johnson was reporting 10.7. And we're kind of going, well, wait a minute, what's happening over here? Are these guys just crazy? Are they lying? Or, or you know, are they adding magic juice to the system? And, and we now have a study out of Wilcox, Arizona, on Howard Buffett's research farm in the upper left, where we, in two years, had an average of 10.8 tons of carbon per hectare. So now we are one of those outliers. And it is the kind of research we want to be doing because if we can do this, find this much speed and rapidity, and I'm just going to jump through these pictures for a minute and show you what happened to the soil carbon, the organic carbon in do Arizona wanna, in that field. Can you take a few minutes, it, Tim, and, and walk through these slides? I mean, give people 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I'll be happy to walk through the slides. I'll go back to the phenomena that occurs in this. But in this slide, the soil organic carbon percentage here is in 2014, they started, um, Buffett started to farm this field in no-till. And you see the uh, soil organic carbon is about 0.8% and it grew slowly with no-tilling. And that's, that's an important element to regenerative ag. It's critical because of the fungal community. But then we went in, we went in there in 2019 and we see in 2021, we jumped it to 1.275%. And the farmer walking into the field could tell the difference just by walking into the field. He goes, I can feel it under my feet, this huge jump. And that's that 10.8 tons. So in, in essence, this is what we're, we're looking at. West and, and Nigel, Nigley in, in uh, Switzerland, who I know and been to their research facility in Rattan Lau, you know, all they report is one, less than one, or just a little over one ton. Whereas we look at these four different averages of Gabe Brown, ourselves, and Russ Hedrick and David, you know, we're at 10 point something. So, so this is the research that gives us a future for the planet and actually gives farmers profit 
because they can greatly reduce their input costs while they're building soil fertility and health. While, Dan, as you said, we can improve water holding capacity, water percolation. And in a place like California now, where we're in the worst drought since the year 800, Colorado River shrinking. I don't know what Phoenix is going to do. Yeah. Uh, we're in a real uh, concerning scenario. Yeah. Uh, we can improve this water cycle dramatically. So you're doing uh, this in Arizona. Agriculture. Go ahead. Arizona and New Mexico, which are basically right down there in the belly of the beach with the, with the Colorado River, right? I mean, yeah, New uh, Mexico, it's not drawing from it, but uh, Colorado is. And, and of course, well, that's the area is. where the ecosystem has shifted and the, and the rains aren't coming sufficiently or they're coming, but they're, the soil can't hold them. And so you don't get that cooling effect. The rains are not. The rains are not. And, and let me just go back to and, and I don't want to get into those conversations about water vapor and, and uh, that kind of thing, because literally I try and keep it more simple. And from this perspective, Carbon in the atmosphere needs to come back to the soil. Yeah. That improves everything. So it yeah. improves the fertility. It improves, Dan, we think, the nutrient density of the food. Yeah. It improves the water holding capacity and drought resistance, also percolation, flood resistance. It improves the health of the plant because there's more biodiversity, because it's feeding the biology. It's because of the biology. And actually, that biology becomes over 50% of that soil carbon. Which is, which is not what we used to look at. <laughs> this is the part of the new paradigm. It's the biology. And it's not about sequestration. It's about cycling, right? It is about a living it's system. Carbon belongs right? in the soil, but it's not about like fixing it inorganically. It's about having to be part of a living ecosystem. We are trying to disabuse everyone from the use of the term sequestration. Yeah. That's typically a dead bound up carbon. Why don't you even like, with well, even like with compost, it's a it's a humate that really is functionally not in the cycle very well, not in the living cycle very well. So this is what we're talking that, about, root exudates. And let me just go back into a few of these slides and just say, from this picture, this comes back to the rhizosphere of the plant where all of this action is taking place. And what this picture is showing us is in a root hair, which is only stimulated to grow if there's biology there and not fertilizer. And, and what we're saying, and I'm not saying no fertilizer, I'm not being a purist on that. I'm just saying so that the plant has to signal it needs more nutrients. Then it exudes these sugars and carbohydrates to feed the organisms within its rhizosphere. And the rationale, of course, biologically, is that nature in its wisdom has created a symbiosis between bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes uh, that are going to bring nutrients to this plant. The reason is the plant will feed them and the exchange happens and the signaling occurs. Uh, it's a wonderful system that will shift your roots to look like these bare white roots in a fertilized cornfield where the root hairs were not stimulated to grow the nutrients sort of came in like chemical dependency, like a needle in a vein. And the plant didn't signal because it didn't need N, P, or K uh, coming from the biological realm of the soil. Whereas one of my former um, fellows in the Ag Leadership Program sent me this picture of, of one of his cover crops. And he says, look at the dreadlocks I have. And he said, now us farmers are starting to brag about our dreadlocks. And the first time I personally saw this was in Africa in my wife's garden. I was pulling a few weeds and they came up and they looked like this. And at the very first, I thought, I've never seen this before. Is this a disease? <laughs> and it's, it is the exudates feeding the organisms. And so it's a sticky, gooey substance uh, as the organisms multiply rapidly, being fed to feed the plant itself. And one of the things I just want to make really clear about the fungal communities is when I was at Rodale, we were working with a, a mycorrhizae specialist out of uh, Eastern uh, Pennsylvania, USDA. And he was mentioning that mycorrhizae is highly correlated to carbon in the soil. Well, one, it's carbon-based, but two is its functional way of working uh, is gonna increase all of the biology. It's gonna provide so much more of a network to that root. As a matter of fact, I've seen claims that when you have a heavily fungal community around the roots, you're going to end up with 50 to 1,000 times more root surface area. 
Uh, imagine that now that root has capacity to access much more water in dry times, to access maybe a boron element that's very rare in the soil, but the plant needs it because those little mycorrhizae can reach out and find it. It's been signaled, the plant signal it needs it and bring it to the plant. And the other thing is that fungal hypha, it can be a lot smaller and narrow and get between cracks of rocks and go find up a find a bound up phosphorus um, element with its enzymes liberate it and bring it to the plant. It reminds me of the soils I was farming in Africa that were tested and they were phosphorus poor. The crops were not gonna were not gonna function well. But in essence, what happened is because the biology, my crops never showed phosphorus deficiency. But you could test the soil and always say, you need to add phosphorus. And of course, I never did. It's because of this biological system that will bring it to the plant and create a healthy cycling of nutrients for that whole system. And that brings us to those kinds of sl slides. So, so I can stop right there on the slides for the moment, Dan, and, and respond to thoughts or, or questions that you might have. Yeah, and other people are trying to send in questions as well. And I would say, you know, it's been on the text, but um, in the chat, but if you've got a question you'd like, you know, Tim to respond to, uh, put it in the Q&A, please. Um, <clears throat> I think before we go any further, let's just talk about what are the implications of that 10 versus that one number? Um, and the, I mean, I, I do think it's good to just run some of these numbers when we're talking about carbon, because people get so worked up and put them in context. I I may be wrong, but I believe it's roughly 10 billion tons of CO2 are put into the atmosphere every year from the burning of hydrocarbons. Roughly 10 billion tons of CO2 are put into the atmosphere every year from the burning of forests. So it's one-to-one -one with hydrocarbons and forests. So just think about the burning that's happening. And it's something like 27 billion tons are put into the atmosphere every year through soil respiration. So a grand total of 50 tons is being put in and the hydrocarbons are only 10 of those. But what's actually going on is that if we're not increasing a total of 50 billion tons every year, a lot of it's being cycled down through photosynthesis and being put into the soil. And so when we talk about how many billion hectares of ag land there are and what would it mean to have 10 billion tons of carbon put into each of those hectares, um, or would that be acres? Yeah. So it's, yeah. Two, it'd be, it'd be so, 20, 20 so yeah, we've, got, we've got to, uh, one of the things is, is lots of reporting comes out into carbon dioxide equivalents. As, right. There's like 37 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents being emitted. And, and that's, you know, about 10 billion tons of carbon. And if you think in terms of what we're reporting at, at 10 tons of carbon per hectare per year, if you yeah. have 1.8 billion hectares, if you just multiply 10 times 1.8, you'd have 18, which means you could draw down immediately. We yeah. can't convert all farmland to that. 11% of that is in rice. Rice isn't going to, isn't going to sequester carb, uh, excuse me, don't use the word sequester, isn't <laughs> going to accrue carbon uh, at that level. It's going to lose methane, et cetera. It's a problem. And, and that's a, a problem needs to be moved to regenerative. It's, it's really high on the list that we need to work more on. And there are going to be places where they're going to be, have droughts and shortage of water. And without water, you don't photosynthesize. So you're going to, you, we can't really say 1.87. But what if we did it on 30%? And if we did it on 30%, we'd, we would take out of the, you know, out of the 10 billion, we would, could pull back 3 billion. We could pull that back. And if we think in terms of grazing land and the work that Peter Bick's doing now and the, the preliminary data that's coming out, and he'll report more on that. His films will come out fairly soon. Yeah. which will start to share those numbers. And, and those numbers, you know, he wants to say, well, we could pull down maybe to 30%, but he was doing math just like I did. If you take his numbers times all the grazing land, well, not all the grazing land is going to pull yeah. down the level that he got in the south of the United States where you had a lot of rain. So there's a lot of grazing land. I can take you to grazing places in Morocco. <laughs> what rain, you know, yeah. it is pretty, it's pretty minimal. But if they could get another 10 or 20%, we could start to draw down 50%, but that would be on an annual basis. But what this means, Dan, is we have to stop emitting and, and we're not getting there, but we have to as a, as a global society. And then we have the chance to start to draw back down. 
And that means we could go from the 417 or the 425 or 450, wherever we meet our peak, hopefully soon we peak and start to go the other way. And we could start to pull it back towards 280 and return that climate to one that's productive, livable, and, and can sustain life in a much more sustainable methodology. So those are kind of the numbers. And the only way we can get there is with regenerative ag. There's no other mechanism to do it. I just had a slide, I don't have to put it up, but I'll give you the numbers that I, I did put together. And that is that carbon capture plant that they had the big news stories about in Iceland would able to pull down 4,000 um, megatons of carbon per year. That means we need 2,325,000 of those CO2 capturing <laughs> physical plants to suck it out of the atmosphere and hope we can store it in the soil below. And that is a $127 trillion bill. Uh, so that's not affordable, it's not doable, but nature, when we support her robustly, can do it immediately starting this year without any infrastructure investment. Uh, and we get all of the other benefits. We get water cycle, we get you know reduced flooding, we get more drought resistance, we get more nutrient density in the food. We get more fertility in the, in the soil and we build for the future. We regenerate for the future. Yeah. But I mean, I think the central point here is that what has been <clears throat> presumed to be true in the global climate conversation about the potential that land could have in this ecosystem, in this, in this ecosystem of, of solutions regarding carbon, regarding the climate, et cetera, that, that potential of agriculture that is, you know, considered in the UN is a tenth of its true potential. Is that is that is that a fair statement? It's actually yeah, yeah, it is. A, well, it's a whole science community. It's still at a tenth of its true potential of its true potential for much of it. For much of it, I don't know about that's a massive. That's a massive point right there. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, you are basically coming up with this pretty categorical data, which says, in contradiction to what has been right. conventionally presented in the climate conversation. Soil is 10 times more powerful than you were giving it credit for, which I think goes to draw down that, that, that whole series of, of, of data points. I mean, it's, it's, it's really massive. And so I don't want to, I don't want to lose the, lose the thread here while we're digressing about what was the world. Um, the real point, as far as I'm concerned, is what a lot of us already presumed you have through Chico State really sort of formalized this, this, you know, understanding that really if we're just talking about carbon we're not understanding all the implications what soil can do is is way more profound than the dominant paradigm is is giving it credit for so that's a that's, really a, th that's the indication but but we're setting out we are setting out to you know to prove this point and what i mean by that is is we're setting out literally to uh create a, a massive project yeah. that we're working towards the funding realm right now um, that will be able to, on multiple farms across this country, compare conventional systems, which are the ones studied by um, Rattan Lal and et cetera, et cetera, yeah. but compare those um, to this regenerative, this robust biological regenerative. And, and I'll just, I'm just gonna put that slide up just from the standpoint to say, the title of it, and you can go online and, and see it, uh, yeah. is the Soil Carbon Accrual Project up in the right-hand corner of this slide. And we've begun this research project on a farm in Blythe, California. And this is a picture of Blythe off the Colorado River. That's Colorado River water being pulled out to farm this area. And uh, the Carbon Underground's joined us. And then so far, Mega Food and Sage Foods have stepped up to, to begin, uh, begin in some of this funding. But the point to this is really clear, is if we can show, which now Metropolitan Water District has come out because part of this land is part of their land they've purchased and it's not their water, but they're trying to get farmers to, to conserve water, um, is they've become very interested in the immediate results we've already shown. In, in just 18 months, this farmer uh, in some of these soils where they, some of them they fallow for four or five years and don't grow anything because Metropolitan will pay them not to farm. And they keep that heavily tilled and disked. And what that's doing, of course, is destroying 
the biology and the whole system. And, and we came in to challenge that, straight up challenge it. And they're seeing, like the farmer saw, that here's soil that he hasn't seen an earthworm in in 30 years because of the tillage and the harvesting and, 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 and the, uh, maybe the chemicals involved in the farming. And in 14 months, where we're doing cover cropping and looking at it, looking at water usage very differently and building soil carbon, there's an earthworm in any spade you want to put down in any spot of the field and turn it over, you'll see an earthworm. It's sort of like nature says, you know, just support me, I'm here. I kind of like, where are these earthworms coming from? Are they falling out of the sky? But there they show up. And it shows how this robust regenerative system can really respond. Nature responds so fast yeah. when we support her in this process. So, you know, the, the point I want to make is that, um, let, me, let me go to this slide, uh, is that our, our typical agriculture and organic fits into some of this at times, uh, into some of these parts. Here, this is another picture in Blythe of some of this fallowed farm field. And, and I took the metropolitan people out and I gave them soil thermometers. And I said, here, it was 100 degrees that day. Put, put the soil, that, that thermometer in that soil. That soil measured 120 degrees. What biology lives in 120 degrees? It doesn't. Not only that, you can talk water vapor, all the different things about climate change. That's like in that field going out in a hundred degree day and turning the heater on and radiating that back up into the atmosphere. It's helping heat the planet by itself, by how we are tilling soils like that. That, that increases the, the, the carbon loss uh, to the atmosphere. The, water point the evaporation water point. Uh, yeah. is going. That is right. Dan, did I lose you? Go ahead. No, no, that, that's the broader point about, about yeah. the the water cycle and the management and the climate Absolutely. effect. We don't actually have to bring CO2 down so far. Right. If we're actually facilitating the climate cooling effect of the water cycle, which, yeah. which carbon is central. And so by doing this, right. it's not just that we have to bring the CO2 levels down, it's really we have to facilitate the cooling cycle, which is the water cycle. Yeah. But which means we have to have the carbon in the soil. And, and that's the only way that cycle works. So we have to be cool so after. Yeah. yeah. What, what happens in our farming systems, and this has been only for 10,000 years, but as we till for 10,000 years, we've lost water holding capacity, we've lost soil fertility, we've lost the structure, so we had yeah. to get erosion, uh, we lost the capacity to percolate, and just out here when we tried to percolate water in, in this, this uh, fallowed field versus where we had the cover crop, it took over nine minutes to percolate an inch of water yeah. uh, in this fallowed field, and it took a minute and 10 seconds in the, where we had planted cover crops for a year. Which is um, so, what happened to civilizations. Civilizations yep. historically over the last 10,000 years have fallen as they be exactly. their land. You know, exactly. David Montgomery has been doing great work on that prior to what he's doing now. But um, sure. yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> and the point is it doesn't have to be that way. And the point is we can turn this around in that land that was so dead and so, you know, right. hot and dry in just over a year through a couple simple things you're able to facilitate transformation so yep. the opportunity is massive um so let's let that's this is the paradigm yeah that's that's an extractive tillage based orientation and input based and that's whether you're conventional agriculture or organic where you're bringing new the the nutrients in where you're bringing uh, a way to try and feed the plant so that, that could be, and I'm not against compost, and I see there's a, a question about biochar. I'm not against those at all. I'm just saying that in a biological system, we begin to negate the need for input systems. Now, I'm saying if you have stuff to compost, by all means, do it. By all means, add to it. But typically, they're, they're bacterial dominant, and we're looking for fungal dominant world. Having said that, the soil and the biology, when you're using multi-species cover crops, become self-organizing. So you can add it and you're going you're gonna to add good stuff, but the biology will organize itself and the fungal communities will take off. That's what we saw in Arizona. We saw what caused those soils where we got 10 tons of carbon per hectare to shift. Was it moved from a bacterial dominant soil to fungal dominant? And the effect of the, the, the variable that caused it was the winter cover crop that was multi-species. Yeah. So that fed that diversity and that 
pushed the fungal world, that pushed the robustness, it seems like, of why we got so much carbon in the soil. So actually a very powerful point you just made, right? That was, I mean, you just condensed a bunch of research into one sentence. It was the, 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 the carbon sequestration, not sequestration, you know, accrual, accumulation, accrual, accrual yeah. um, occurred foundationally because of a shift from a bacterially dominant microbiological dynamic to a fungally dominant yeah. microbiological dynamic. Yeah. And that was caused by a polyculture, at least during part of the year, that was keeping the soil fed alive, living roots, um, when otherwise it wouldn't have been fed. So keeping the soil covered, keeping it alive, applying polycultures is effectively what we need to do to facilitate this carbon sequestration process. Yes, and remember that polyculture should have grasses, legumes, and forbs. Yeah. It should have them all in Multiple that system. Families of plants. Yeah. Families. So if you, go, if you go to Gabe Brown's uh, work, a training with, with whatever, they're going to talk about all that quite a bit, and then they use animals in the process. One of the things that we wanted to show, even though Cindy Daly and I are both animal people, I still have 100 head of registered Holsteins, um, I would love them. She still has her organic dairy on campus and, and has 1,700 acres of grazing land at, at her home. We wanted to be able to show farmers, how, can you do it without animals? And this shows, yes, the biology of the soil can be fed, you know, with these cover crops, and then you can move to your cash crop and then go back to your covers, et cetera. And the system seems to want to function. But we've got to do this big research project because this is a paradigm change. We will be ignored by most with our data yeah. because it's, it's, it's a singular farm, et cetera. It's one cropping system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So that's, that's why we're trying to get out and get this thing funded at about an eight and a half million dollar project. And, and we need every $5 contribution to a hundred thousand to a million, but it's important because this is going to help shift the UN, the, the federal government, state governments to look at how do you incentivize or shift agriculture? What policies are impeding the shift? Let's get those out of the way to start with. Uh, and then- Or at least reduce the things we should incentivize. Yeah, well, I, 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 uh, Dan Deschute uh, from um, Indiana, he said to me, because he did an Eisenhower fellowship and I was asking him, because I'd done a Kellogg fellowship and I asked the same questions and we both ended up, I ended up decades before him in Australia. He went to Australia. And I think we both learned, he said, I said, so what do you think is the best thing the government can do to help incentivize the move to regenerative ag? And he said, kill all the programs. And he says, yeah. all the subsidies, I just kill them all. <laughs> and and uh, so that's the point. Then the farmers have to kind of go, well, wait a minute, how do I make this work? How do I make this work? And that pushes you into the, the whole regenerative system. And because the people that are doing it aren't getting, aren't getting the benefit. They're getting of no subsidies. Things. They're getting right. no subsidies. Mean, People yeah. actually do. <laughs> yeah. If you want to apply subsidies, fine for people who want to do that. Yeah. But yeah. for starters, just stop yeah. Yeah. feeding the bad, right? right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I just want to make a comment. I see it and I can't, I'm sorry, I'm not following everybody's we'll, uh, we'll do the question yet. We'll try sure, to have, we're almost there. But yeah. Stephen Swick just mentioned, and he's and he's right. I could go on and on about the benefits of cattle, about the, the uh, saliva, about the manure, about all of those, about all of that biology. It's all valid. But we're just showing that without it, we got to jump too. And and in essence, um, nature evolved with animals. So I'm all for it, but a lot of farmers are just not going to do it. And how do we get them there? Because we need every farmer to build their soil for a future for all of us, not just for their own profit. So that's why we're happy to see these data points come up that's kind of matching the animal world and those that want to do the grazing and can incorporate it, do it. But, but we're, we want to show an avenue if you don't have it or can't do it or, you know, are not a husbandry uh, person. Earthworms were animals. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, you said that that, that, that cropland there in California, is, you're not running cows on it, are you? No. No. But how many tons of earthworm meat are there on every acre? <laughs> yeah. How well, many know, but it'd be huge. Of, yeah. How many tons of, of earthworm castings, which we could yeah. call manure, right. Right. are being applied on that acre? Yep. You've got yep. animals there. Right, yeah. I mean, mites are animals. We do. Yeah, right. we have the livestock below the ground. We do. Yeah. That all, that all, that all counts. Yeah. It's not about. Exactly. It doesn't have to be four-legged. Some 
a certain you know number of tons per per acre. It's um, a good point because so what goes through the intestines of an earthworm and and what comes out is so beneficial biologically to the system. Unbelievable! It's huge. It's just. I mean, I, people said, "Do you apply fertilizer?" I said, "No. I have right. a rule on my farm that you thou shalt not apply nitrogen." Yeah. And like, blah, 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 blah. compost. I right. said, no, no, no compost. Like, how do you do it? I said, well, I go out with a flashlight at night, you know, just this time of year. And you turn the flashlight on and they're, just, they're going at it. They're just all over the place. Mm -hmm. they, you know, if you're barefoot, it's the, the ground is, it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, the piles are everywhere. I'd like, as I understand it, I think it's 20 tons of earthworm castings per acre per year are what is applied by uh, 15 per square yard. Mm -hmm. 15 mm -hmm. per, which, I, you know, a shovel, a couple, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So that's, that's 20 tons. Um, anyway, but so I, I want to get to the questions, but I want to just sort of drive home your point with what you're doing with this research you're, you're calling out and just bring in, if I may, Roland Bunch, who you brought up at the very beginning as someone you, you learned from, but as I understand it, is a brilliant individual who many should know of and don't um, in his work in Africa. Um, but also tease it together with the conservation ag versus regenerative ag um, conversation. As I understand it, there's a sort of dynamic where I think what Roland was doing with conservation ag, which is very, very similar to regenerative ag, but has you know, been around for four decades instead of four years. Um, they've done a lot of work to build momentum in the UN and that global community with that series of understandings. And here we are in the Anglophone West with this new word regenerative. And we're like entirely oblivious of the decades of work that have been done globally in a deep community. And so we've got like this, like regenerative ag, this new amazing thing. And they've got conservation ag, this amazing deep thing, which is not permaculture or organic or biodynamics or, or any of these other things, which are all part of the same thing. So maybe just, you know, from a global context, how many amazing people are doing what kind of thing, uh, what's being shown just with Roland's work and your understanding of it in Africa, of people really profoundly shifting the ecosystems and and some comment you know what you're saying with the research you're trying to direct or you're in the process of, of formalizing more fully is if we pull this off then we can integrate all this understanding into a real global um you know data set that is incontrovertible right so yes absolutely and so i i know the the leaders uh well the one of the international sort of um communicators for conservation ag very well howard buffett was very much in conservation ag it's one of the reasons i wanted to go with them so they had basic principles reduced or, or eliminate soil disturbance keep the soil covered which is really important um uh, and rotate so that's has some rotate, rotate, rotate crops that's yeah. not roland's work i'll tell you about roland's work that, roland's work is different um, so in essence, Howard had an interest in cover crops, which we were doing at Rodale. And, and so between Howard and I, we wanted to kind of combine this no-till idea with, with cover cropping. And then when is know, this? there was a lot of single species cover cropping going on at the time, certainly with Rodale, et cetera. And this multi-species is where we have to go. And, and I didn't even do that very well in Africa. I, I was not, but I, I had some really powerful rotations that I think helped make up for that. And why I saw yields increase for smallholders from one ton of corn per hectare to five tons, you know, and it's just like, boom, biology, biology wants to work w when it gets supported. Well, conservation ag in some ways is, is stalling a little bit on adoption, which, which is wrong. We need to stop tilling and we need to rotate and we need to leave the soil covered. But now in that soil covered where we have enough water, we'd rather have it covered with living root. Yeah. And if we don't have the water, then keep it covered with residue. But in so many areas of the world, that residue gets grazed off to where there's nothing left. And so you're not building that soil carbon. So, so these are some principles that need to happen. Roland, and, and when I met him in Honduras, because he was in Central America for uh, most of his early career. And in essence, he was saying to me back then, he said, well, you know, Tim, he says, we're building soil at an inch a year. And he said, there's not a textbook in the world that says you can do that. And I said, wow. And that's where I, you know, I'm really my thinking started to shift from all the things I'd learned and known and farmed and kind of, wow, of course, that was humid tropics and there are certain advantages, but he was using macuna planted late in corn systems that then would grow up and just cover that corn. And then they'd machete it all down and leave it. And, and they were building soil very, very rapidly. 
years later, like in 2000 and uh, probably about um, 12 or 13, we were both speaking in Zambia at a continent-wide uh, gathering, mostly for conservation ag, but also some, they weren't using the term regenerative yet. We really hadn't gotten it out. But in essence, um, he said to me, he said, well, you know, Tim, he says, when I told you we could, we could build topsoil an inch a year, he said, I was lying to you. And I go, holy cow, Roland, you don't know how many people all over the world I've told that story to. He goes, yeah, we were doing much more than that, but I knew you wouldn't believe me. So, but, but, but he was about um, basically getting the right interplantings, the right uh, cover crops, the right green manures in the system to build a lot of biomass. And he still has a legume focus on nitrogen and we just know now, and I spend a lot of time with Roland in conversation and he just emailed me. Well, we're in a lot of conversation. We, we continue to talk a lot, but, but he has such success with, with less diversity that he hasn't stepped into the real multi-species world yet. Uh, and it would be harder in the communities he's working in. So he's living in Malawi right now, working quite a bit in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, Madagascar. Um, in particularly cover cropping and showing, particularly with such things as jack bean and the planting of glycidia trees in an agroforestry environment of really raising the yield levels, raising the drought resistance in those fields and really helping those farmers. And, and so he's doing that with almost no funding. He's looking for funding too, um, doing great work. I sit on the board of directors of Groundswell International and we are rapidly moving to the more biological focused agroecological investment. Yeah. And there are some brilliant people there. Peter Gubbles in, in Africa and Ghana, my wife and I visited him when, when we were, because we were in Ghana every year for a, a few weeks. Uh, tremendous work and, and Stephen Sherwood in Ecuador, tremendous work and, and Edwin down in Central America. And now we're helping and some of our research is helping inform their work to where we can boost that um, food security, community and economic development through this regenerative approach. So it's, it's really, really positive. And, and those are some of the better ones that I see being done. I think the CRS in Central America uh, that Howard's funding some is getting to some of this, but not. I don't know well enough to, to speak intelligently uh, yet on that. We're gonna be in India in September with natural agriculture that's doing multi-species planting of the crop, seed inoculation with manures and some other things that they've created and seen tremendous results in yields. Uh, and we're gonna try and look at their biological focus and how they're making this happen where they're trying to convert uh, to 3 million farmers in the Andhra Pradesh province alone yeah. into this system. And it's happening pretty rapidly. So this is where regeneration where yeah. we can you know, begin to share information, but get this hard data to shift the mindsets where the Gates Foundation and UN policy and development goals are, are still nitrogen fertilizer focused. <laughs> that has to stop tomorrow. Uh, here's, here, I got to show, <laughs> I, I show you this, this, this slide because it, is, it, it kind of um, blew my mind. I, I actually had known a little bit about um, what you know nitrogen fertilizers do with regard to climate. But here's a slide that blew my mind because I saw some recent data that said air travel contributes about 900 million tons of CO2 while nitrogen fertilizer contributes about 1200 million tons. And I kind of go on, what? It's even bigger than air travel? You know, so the way we eat has more impact on climate than, than our excessive flights that we all do in, in this country anyway, you know, that, that's kind of problematic. And, you know, it, it kind of brought me to a, a, a conceptual framework. And, and I kind of used this recently in a talk where I said, you know, to be just a little bit um, liberal with Wendell Berry's quote that eating is an agricultural act. I kind of want to say eating is a climate act performed three times a day. You know, that's the biggest impact we would have on climate if we really not only chose, but insisted on acquiring regeneratively produced food that is capturing this carbon uh, instead yeah. of what we, how we source now. Which segues beautifully to the work of the BFA, which is 
to focus on the, the food that you eat as the thing that you can do, yes. not just for yourself, but for the ecology. So yes. yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Well, we have used up about 50 minutes so far, and I've got a, almost a couple of 18, 17 questions right now in the Q&A. Are you ready for a little uh, quick? Let's go. Absolutely. Quick, uh, through and invite people to um, um, post uh, as, as we go forward. Dan, do you want to select and, and I'll respond? Sure. I think I'm just going to go through quickly. And I think okay. we'll see. Um, is your Ukulima research facility still operative? Ukulima. Boy, there's somebody with some knowledge. Um, is it, John, oh, is it available? John uh, it's still operative. Oh, that, that has, uh, Howard gave that whole farm away. He acquired, I'd known him before he had that, that farm. He pulled together four farms. It created 9,000 acres. And he was also breeding cheetahs and trying to figure out what was sustainable for cheetahs while we were doing some of this agricultural work. Um, and then he closed the whole system down. And there were some, there were some security issues, et cetera, et cetera, that occurred. But in essence, um, he focused $500 million into Rwanda uh, as, a, as where a president was more stable towards the work that he wanted to see done. So that stopped. Uh, but it's funny because in Arizona, that Ukulima farm sign is hanging on the barn <laughs> there in Arizona. And the guy I, who was managing that, that big 9,000 acres is, is doing Howard's work there. And so I have that tangential relationship. Every time I get to Arizona, I go, aha, there was the Ukulima. Uh, but we're doing it now you know, on what we would call scale neutral. So we're doing it with big tractors here, but it can work, these principles work if it was a smallholder farmer with one acre. Yeah. you know, hand, hand done, for sure. All right, beautiful. Um, Janice asks, what was Roland's last name? It's Roland Bunch, Bunch. And he has a, you know, his first book that became very, like a bunch of charts. Yeah, his first book became very famous was Two Ears of Corn. That has a lot of development principles and even uh, the Peace Corps used to use it as a training manual. But Roland now, his, his book that he's promoting is, is about green manure cover crops. And I, and I think he might even get it on Amazon. Uh, but again, he's a little, I would pause it. And if Roland was here, I'd do it with him. So I'm not talking behind his back and I've done it with him. I would push more towards more diversity in his cover crops. And we can do that easily in this country because we can access seed, all kinds of seed. He can't do it so easily in some of those African countries. I know I've tried, so it's a challenge. Beautiful. All right, uh, Willie, um, has a, I'll just read the whole thing. I tend to prescribe to the Waltheana paradigm where he attributes climate change to broken water cycles as a result of carbon depletion rather than a gas that's increased from 0.028% to 0.045. Um, that has so much influence. The best example of this is the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico where Alejandro Carrillo has restored the water cycles so much that you can see a rain episode separated by his fence line. Are you, have you, I've heard stories about that place down there. Have you been there or can you speak to that? I can speak to that, and you're going to make me. You're yeah. going to make me try and open a, a, another um, <laughs> PowerPoint if I can pull one up here. See where I might still have it. Um, that, in fact, uh, will show a picture exactly of that. And and this questioner has some pretty good knowledge um, and exposure to this question. I think I have a picture of it. Yes, right here. So now let me go back to share screen and address um, this question or comment right here. Share, and let's go here. So here we go, Sonora and, and these grasslands. So this is the same desert area. And you are, of course, seeing bare soil that's eroding and washing away as poor soil. And there's very little photosynthesis going on on the one on the left. And that's the way most of those desert areas look. Uh, but this rancher, uh, through holistic grazing, AMP grazing, um, shifted and did intensive grazing, short time exposure, and look at the grasses that he got to come back uh, in that system. So that whole area is photosynthesizing, it's pulling carbon down, it's putting in the soil, feeding the biodiversity, and he can stock at much higher levels, over 10 times the intensity of numbers of cattle that will be sustained by those grasslands on the right versus the bare soil on the left. So that's carbon capture, that's biodiversity improvement, that's water cycling, that's gonna help rains. 
that's going to hold moisture, believe it or not. It's not going to use more. It's going to hold more. It's going to cool the planet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So exactly. Uh, and I hope I responded uh, appropriately to the question. I think the specific point was about the um, rain falling where there is uh, the water cycling and not. And maybe that was just a misinterpretation. Well, there's a better, there's, I don't know that as, as, um, as a testimony or, or a comment there. I do, I've heard it um, be the case with regard to, you know, the rabbit proof fence in the Western part of Australia. Yeah. Where the farmers went in and cleared a lot of the, of the trees and the, and the indigenous plant material that was there. And they started to farm it, you know, disc it, plow it, farm it. And the rain stopped. And once the uh, clouds that used to form offshore and come on a rain there, they stopped forming to where they dropped any rain on the farmland. But when it got past the rabbit proof fence to where the natural vegetation was, it would start to rain. Yeah. So yeah, we can disturb those systems and yet we can restore and regenerate those systems too. Yeah, well, and, and I think the, the, the central point for those who haven't been down this particular rabbit hole is that when you got green plants, you know, on the ground, <laughs> photosynthesizing and respiring, um, that helps make clouds that make rain. And so when you've got bare ground, that doesn't happen. When you've got covered ground, it does. It's really a, it's not just about the carbon and atmosphere, it's about how life is working with itself. Um, but yeah, and we, you know, one of the, the rain, the rain causative factors in, in that leaf matter is the organisms that live on, on the leaf matter that they, they get blown up into the sky that help form the rain droplets to help come back to the ground. The micro is not there. The biology is still part of the biology up in the clouds coming back down to the earth and, and that's the structure behind clouds is microbes. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a powerful story. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to keep moving through here. Uh, Steven Zwick, I'm guessing you know him, somebody yes. I hope we'll have in this, um, in your seat here soon. Uh, <laughs> well, you should. Uh, Steven writes really good blogs. Um, I mean, he's he on the list. Really, really, really does great work. Might be on in two weeks uh, on, on um, um, enteric emissions. Um, so I'm going to read this question here. What, if any, value does meta analysis of the old science papers like Law 2004 have in assessing the amount of carbon any soil can hold? Pretty much seems that all this old science based on paradigms regarding soil organic matter formation don't account for soil molecular biology at all. Thus, all this old science looks more at dirt than living soil. That's a great way to put it because what we're talking about is we're talking about a broken, a, a non functional soil system because the biology is not functional and they're bacterial dominant, which means we're not going to have this great fungal response that we see when we get to a functional living soil system. And so most of the old studies are done with broken, non-functional soils. And this paradigm change moves to a living, vibrant system. And I, I just want to say living and breathing because soil breathes, you know, CO2 in through photosynthesis and it breathes it out through biological decomposition of some of the organic matter. And a lot of assumption in the, in, the, in the scientific world is it's an equilibrium. So how are you gonna gain soil? Right. But in essence, what, and David Johnson showed this on some of his trials in New Mexico, that he and I, when we were walking through uh, Will Harris's uh, ranch in Georgia and saw on Will's desk, the same chart that uh, Jason Roundtree out of Michigan State had analyzed in Will Harris's soil, is that in these fungal dominant soils, what happens is, is you gain 10 times the level of carbon and you reduce the respiration by four times of what's lost. Yeah. And it looks like, and on some Peter Bick's work, it looks like maybe what's happening is at night, the regenerative soil is not losing it where the conventional soils are still losing it at the same rate as during the day. And it seems to be the difference between bacterial and the fungal world in that soil. Which is part of why it's going to cost $8 million for you to do your project, because you've got these big, fancy, real-time carbon sensing. Flux you know, towers. Flux, flux towers. towers. Which is monitoring it minute by minute and seeing yeah. at, you know, six inches, at two feet, at 10 feet. Right. What is the CO2 level? John Kempf always says, in a growing cornfield, carbon deficiency is a limiting factor. 
because they're sucking up so much carbon dioxide from the immediate environment. Like it's zero ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere in the cornfield. Sure. And carbon is a limiting factor. So sure. all these things as we understand them, again, to the point, you know, we'll be able to provide great confidence to anybody who's, you know, wanting to present to formal legislative and legal bodies um, to as to the science. And so. we need it and we can get it within three to five years. And yeah. and that's kind of like the the time frame we need to get this out there and it, it just i mean when i talk and spend time with russell hedrick in north carolina and, and look at the kind of results he's getting in his fields and he's now incorporated livestock in those two in his cover crops but but the kind of response he's getting and the nutrient density shifts he's getting in his product he's been doing this you know by just asking questions and talking to people and and learning and trying and and most of his neighbors would just ignore him and ignore him until the year that there was such a drought that the average uh, corn yield was nine bushels <laughs> nine. And, his, and his was like 108, 170 or something like that. And then they go, what the hell did you do? I mean, they could no longer ignore him, you know. Uh, I, think I remember I, that summer. I think I remember that summer. It was so bad. Yeah, it, it was, was terrible. Really yeah. was terrible. <laughs> All right, um, moving, moving forward to these questions here. Uh, Brooke asks, can you speak to the differences between carbon cycling in aerobic and anaerobic environments? Well, listen, we want our soils aerobic. And, and in essence- well, There are um, some anaerobic environments like 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 a beaver ponds, right? Oh, 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 yeah. No, you know, that's not gonna be- not, like, not, not, not gonna be my specialty, but I'll tell you, when you get into um, like uh, peat bogs, et cetera, that's a huge carbon accrual process. And yeah, that's a, a lot of water. So it, it's gonna depend on, and we can go to seaweed. Seaweed can capture all, a whole bunch of carbon dioxide. Uh, we can set up seaweed farms like crazy to help this process too. Uh, or there's support, no question. Or support the the edges of the planet of, of the continents, not right. to have farms, but just not to be abused. Right. For sure. For sure. But anyway, so, seaweed yeah. is massively important. Just interrupting. <laughs> you, you know, there's another thing that we didn't that we didn't mention that I, I kind of want to mention is the inorganic carbon. And one of the things I've always tried to push for, and we're going to do this in this big project is you know as we get it funded and we need we need we're working hard on the funding it's it's really hard to get it seems like people don't care companies don't care about the planet really they talk about it but they don't just say it's a pittance of money to really get all of this data that will help inform everybody but the point is is that inorganic carbon is a crucial part of the question because it is a huge amount of carbon in a biologically active soil and where there's a lot of rainfall, that inorganic carbon leaches out and you go, well, you've lost it. No, yeah. it came through photosynthesis. The biology below helped convert it into the inorganic. It leached out and it went to the ocean and it deposited on the ocean floor. So it's no longer living in the atmosphere. It's at the bottom of the ocean. In the arid soils where the researcher uh, Mongren out of, uh, out of New Mexico State had shown in the arid soils, it will stay there, but it lots of times will leach down to three to six meters. So it goes pretty deep. That's awesome. not going to return to the atmosphere. And so it's an important element and it, the biology has to be there to cause the chemical reactions to occur, to turn that carbon into inorganic that will stay there a long, long time. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, there's a, a few questions here, just a couple, maybe just logistics, John asks, when you refer to approximately 10 tons of carbon per hectare per year, is that elemental carbon or CO2 equivalent? That is carbon. That means we're talking about, you know, 36 tons of CO2 equivalent. And that's per hectare per year or per, per acre? hectare per year? Per hectare so per year. That's about two and a half acres. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Brooks question we've addressed. Uh, Peter Bick was the answer to Scott's question. Um, what is the name of the person doing the grazing studies and movie? Peter Bick, B-Y-C-K, I believe. Um, if people aren't familiar with his work and his wife as well, I can't remember her name, I'm sorry, but I think they're a team. Would you share a little bit about what they've been doing? It's quite Surely. significant. So, so Peter had come to me when I was at Rodale and talking about we could capture all the carbon when, as he was making the, the film that had been on Netflix for a while, Carbon Nation. And I, and I told him, but look at, we can capture carbon in the soil. 
And that was he, because he'd been talking to Richard Branson and people like that, you know, how do we fix this you know, carbon emission thing? Well, that actually inspired Peter to go look, and then he got very focused on grazing and AMP grazing, and Richard Teague's work, et cetera. Yeah. And so he really went to work and got Shell Oil and McDonald's and Cargill to put some money together, knowing that food supply was going to be at risk if they didn't do something about climate and got money to be able to start to study grazing lands. And he brought together a team of scientists like we're doing, like we've done now at Chico for this big project, a team of scientists from multiple universities. He had already done that in the grazing world. And he used uh, four or five farms with partner farms, conventional grazing versus AMP grazing. And over the course of these uh, last uh, five years or so, they've been collecting data with flux towers, with biodiversity counts, et cetera, et cetera, and noticing significant differences between AMP grazing and the um, uh, conventional grazing. Peter is not a soil scientist. Peter is not a scientist. He is a filmmaker. Filmmaker. <laughs> and yet he's the principal investigator because none of the scientists who also had busy lives who were participating with him had the time to take it on. And so he became the principal investigator. Love Peter. I uh, was just, uh, he and I were going to be together at Sun Valley uh, at the conference up there last month. Um, and he showed one of the first parts of his film, except his flight got canceled. So I just facilitated with him on Zoom. And um, his film, he's doing a four part film that will come out probably on Netflix or something like that, reporting on this data and these farmers and, and their change. And he's going to report, I think, um, I don't think it's spilling the beans that with the data, when neighbor farmers saw the data and the differences, it made a difference in their mindset. And, and that's a good thing. That's why we think this data is really crucial to help people see about profit, about soil health. Um, and a lot of farmers don't wanna talk about climate and with them, we don't have to talk <coughs> about climate. Just help them with these two elements and understanding and they'll help us all with climate, whether they want to or not, because carbon's gonna be in the soil now, not in the atmosphere. Beautiful, yeah, wonderful work. For those who are not familiar, uh, definitely worth looking up and keeping your eye out. It, you know, sounds like it could be the next kiss the ground kind of big well, thing. Uh, Peter, you can yeah. watch some of Peter's clips. Uh, he has some short, some shorts on on Vimeo, et cetera. Just go online, look up Carbon Cowboys, and he's a great filmmaker. Uh, this project is not online yet. Yeah. And the other one that you may really enjoy is, is Will Harris's uh, farming scenario in Bluffton, Georgia. And that film is titled 100,000 Beating Hearts, and, and you'll love it. So yeah. he does great work. Beautiful. Uh, Roger Weiss asks, what are the three most impactful things needed to accelerate adoption of regenerative ag practices? What are the three most impactful things needed to accelerate the adoption? Uh -huh. Okay, so you know, here's the thing is, what are the levers that that can make adoption happen? And, and in talking with Rick Clark out of Indiana, I love this because I've been at regenerative agriculture for a couple of decades now using the term trying to get this going. And as an old uh, conventional farmer, then an organic, you know, I still eat and, and grow organic, but I don't talk about organic anymore. You know this, Dan. And the reason is, is that there's a division and there's a battle and there's a we're better than and there's a marketing thing in all of that conversation. And organic still only represents 1% of the land in this country and that will not save the planet. We need the 99% of the farmers and, and that's who we wanna communicate with. But what Rick Clark said to me when I first time I talked to him because he has an amazing way of rolling his rye down, his cover, rye cover crop down six weeks after he's planted his soybeans. And I thought, <laughs> brave guy. <laughs> Although I tried some of that in, in, in Africa and it actually works, but he really did it on scale. And he has no weed problem and he has a lot more biomass and, he, and, and it, the, the soybeans just lean over and they stand right back up and the rye is, is knocked down. But he said to me, he says, regenerative agriculture, this is a farmer led movement. And not did, I didn't argue with him for one second, I go, Hooray. I love to hear that. Farmer-led is going to have much more traction than university-led or government-led or whatever. So 
farmers let they're sharing this information and it is it is a movement you know organic's been around for 100 years since since the time of rudolf steiner and it represents one percent of the land Ugh, that's almost a failure as a movement I, i'm really disappointed but we have to do this in 10 years so so what's going to change it the next big lever when i look at it is to say uh it's consumers consumers have to start to demand regenerative food and i'll share a story that that um uh, gunderson at um, regen ag labs told me and he said that uh like 120 food companies called him at regen ag lab went on a zoom with him and said you know what's a regenerative soil what, what do we need what are we doing and he said why are you really here and they said, well, well, because, and he said, hey, they went through all this. He says, no, I'm going to tell you why you're here. He <laughs> said, the reason you're here is because if the consumer said, I want my Cheerios in a pink box, within a week, you'd have Cheerios in a pink box. And he said, the guy from General Mills said, no, you're wrong. If the consumer said that, we'd have it in three days. <laughs> so in essence, if we say, the consumers start to demand and we want measurable outcome-based regenerative metrics. We don't want practice-based yeah. because there's workarounds, there's cheating, there's greenwashing and, pra and practice-based. But in outcome-based, none of that can occur and that will help the planet, it will help the farmer, it will help the consumer. So as soon as the consumer starts to demand it, more, more companies will get involved. I'm involved right now with uh, looking at producing a film uh, on regenerative ag. And in essence, we were talking with the people at Nestle in, in Switzerland, and, and they made a huge commitment. How much is greenwashing? How much is real? How much is, you know, whatever. But they made a huge commitment to regenerative. Problematically, when these companies say our goal is to be net zero by 2050, that's too late. That's way too late. Yeah. So we have to have pressure on them to get that Cheerio moves to that pink box in three days. I mean, that's the kind of maybe. 25. <laughs> it's a big <laughs> lever. 25. Yeah. So all of us need to get involved in that as consumers. We eat three times a day. That's why I say, you yeah. know, uh, this is a climate act um, with regard to how we're eating. Uh, and I think it's the second biggest lever. Uh, so to the first one is in its farmer led. What was, the, what was the essence of farmer it? Farmer led and now consumer, now consumer yeah. pushed. And then yeah. We can talk about all of the kinds of levers, push with the company, you know, invest with the right companies. The other things would be as, you know, politicians and, and, and policies. And in California, of course, we have a lot of policies and some soil based. Um, and we need like our data out of this meta work we want to do to help inform California policy because we have, we have more bare ground out here than probably any farmland in the country. Yeah. And, and that needs to change, but we have to get the data to the, Policymakers and and so this is time. actually entirely applicable because I know I happen to know who Roger is and he's on the National Academy of Sciences whatever their board is that's looking at ag and natural resources he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences board mm -hmm. and so your answer to him I think I just heard one farmer led two consumer pulled pushed whatever your you know adjective is there and data connected right. coordinated so. You know, if you were, if you had the ability to speak to the National Academy of Science and say, this is what you should be doing, what would you say? Well, an opportunity to speak to them. Yeah, I, I would literally show them and go back to the say that what we've been studying, you know, for the past couple hundred years is a broken non-functional soil system. And therefore we're handicapping ourselves as to what the potential that can be done. Let's rapidly study this potential of where the biological world could take us in the realm of what nature knew how to do and take the Has earth from a thousand parts per million to 280. W why don't we support that system that's been proven uh, and that has wisdom and is more complex than we can ever figure out. And I hope we never do figure it all out. Uh, and let's support that and, and let's get this going. So let's get the data. Let's go. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of fire in here. <laughs> <Probably. God>. It's <laughs> right here, Dan. It's right I know. here. You know? I know. It's just a question of connecting the dots, Tim. It's just a question yep. of just like yep. calmly, step by step. We just keep moving forward. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Willie asks about your email address. I believe it's yours he's asking for. Um, I'm, maybe it's through connecting to the what you're doing or are you? It's real here? simple. It's Tim.LaSalle uh, at gmail 
Okay. That, that's real simple. And yeah. I can just uh, put it up here real, real quickly and also Cindy Daly's um, yeah. as well. Um, so we'll just get that up there. So any way to connect with us for sure. All right. Um, I'm scrolling here through the questions that are left. Uh, have you seen any that you would like to answer that I haven't brought up yet? Or you're not watching too closely. Let me go back to the let me go back to the chat so I can actually see those because you know, to try and respond and um, it's a Q and I like. haven't done. It's a uh, there's a question about biochar. Um, let me just make a point. Early on in biochar in the 07 or whatever, I really became inquisitive about it and realized it's it's a difficult thing to make. So there are three primary variables. The the temperature of paralysis is a variable. The feedstock that goes into the paralysis is a variable and the soil type is a variable. And unless those all three line up appropriately, the response that people wanna look for typically is not gonna be there. And I tried some in some homemade stuff in Africa because they talked about a solution for Africa. And I'm thinking most of those people need that wood for firewood or for home heating or whatever. And, and this is not where it should go. It also makes me think, cause I saw in the Midwest there were biochar systems being set up in the middle of corn country saying we're going to take the crop waste and burn it and make this biochar and I screamed and going are oh my god are you kidding me that's food for the organism the soil needs to be covered stop this conversation so to me feedstock's a huge question around biochar and in California we have feedstock and I have some friends doing some really important work in this where you can make like almonds carbon negative by making the shells into biochar using the energy to send back to PG&E and being able to dry them uh, for free energy in essence, because you get it out of that system. And so that's a, really an important element where you use walnut shells, uh, peach pits, uh, something that isn't gonna break down very fast is, is a very slow carbon um, cycling system. Uh, and like in the almond orchards where we have 2 million acres, uh, they sort of cap out at 20, 20 some years and need to be pushed and then how do you recycle them? Well, you could run that through a biochar system uh, from the standpoint and then use return that to the soil. But one of the points that, that I make about it is, is it's the biology, it's, it's not the biochar. And people say, well, that's like a hotel for the biology. And I'm thinking, well, you can check into a hotel, but you got to eat. And that's where you got to get to the rhizosphere. That's where the biology needs to be with the live root. So I know it's a, it's a recalcitrant uh, a carbon. It's going to stay there for a thousand years, put it in the soil, fine. Uh, I wouldn't spend a lot of energy on it, except where it is in a system like that shelling environment where you can use a product to create energy and you can return that that came from the farm back to the farm. And if it's inoculated, you can be- I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna respond to that point because I think I, I might have a point where I disagree with you. Um, but you know, looking at the landscape, you know, we'll let the oceans be for now. Although we think that kelp forests are extremely important, um, you know, there's a lot of the land surface of the planet that's um, not in agriculture and not desert. Um, you know, it's forest or, or something like that. And we have serious issues with forest fires now here in the states as well as other parts of the world. I think it was something along the lines of one to one as far as CO2 emitted into the atmosphere from forest fires and from um, hydrocarbon uh, you know burning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm looking at you know wherever it is in the mountain west which just doesn't really matter. As I understand it you know indigenous communities have the opinion that our role was to as humans was to be caretakers of the land and the sort of ecological environmental movement has been advocating for us to not engage with the land and we've got in many cases overgrowth of understory, which is in a drought dynamic, turning into cataclysmic forest fires, would it not be most, you know, strategic to think about biochar in a format as, you know, a new CCC of people coming into the land, you know, building beaver ponds for themselves if beavers aren't there, you know, thinning up the underbrush, making biochar out of it, getting access, you know, to the real world and experience with your hands. I mean, I do think there's a potential role there um, but just maybe outside of the formal agri agricultural ecosystem, you can even come in after that and put in your your, your peach pits and your and your uh, <laughs> pear seeds. Well, Dan, it's it's a great idea, and I think a lot of us have thought about that. Uh, but I would 
would posit at least that the the practical realities of clearing out that brush by hand is very expensive. The the process with and and people aren't going to do it. I mean, we don't have the employees to do that right now to kind of think about moving that. It would but if probably, say, say there were to be an, an, an a uh, economic you know downturn in the near future. If and... there if there would and it's and it's a maybe thing, but would say probably uh, using proper animal movement through those systems would be a, a better process of clearing out a lot of that brush from goats to sheep to uh, sometimes eventually then maybe some cattle. There's some debate and some, some questions about thinning forests, but that may be able to greatly reduce, but it's an expensive thing and w lumber companies won't do that. So it's a problematic question. Is it important? Yes, it is. It is important and we've mismanaged the systems. A lot of the indigenous communities had, as you know, planned burns through those systems. And, and if yeah. you looked at a lot of the older forest, the tree spacing was much wider. And there sometimes were meadows in between, uh, you know, for deer grazing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, elk. And so, yeah, that's where it needs to go. Um, biochar, just the movement. One of the carbon questions is, is, is the movement into those, you know, where do you yeah. get the plant, transport it, uh, labor, et cetera. So it might be that animal uh, usage in those systems, and, and there are a lot of, I have a friend here who has a business. She, she's a, a, a professor at Cal Poly, but she and her partner has a business with sheep and goats. And for fire management, um, the city of Paso Robles has used them along the Salinas River all the time now because they realized very fast when they had homeless issues and fires starting down in the riverbeds among all the trees down there, uh, it cost them thousands and thousands of dollars to fight those fires I guess run, the goat, we, run the goats and sheep through clear that system out and, and you yeah. just don't have a problem anymore you know? whatever it is i think uh, an active strategy for re-engaging those sort of forested lands in a more holistic manner is, is part of the solution set that we need to be considering um for beyond sure. the cultural land but for sure all right um so let me see um michael uh, what are the regenerative in interventions that you were seeing results from? No till, no inputs, cover crops, any other? I think it was, yeah, minimal disturbance of the soil, but it was multi-species cover crops in the winter, keeping the soil covered and, and alive entirely is what facilitated the, the fungal. But yes, and, and one of the things, you know, here, when we think how much of the carbon we've exhausted out of the soil, we've mined out of the soil through our farming practices, and, and how much we can maybe build back. One of the questions we hold, and if we can, we can get ourselves funded strongly enough, I want to, we've started in Blythe, a really uh, question I wanted to try, and we've begun it, I hope we can keep it funded. And that is on 75 acres, we've asked the farmer not to farm it, but to grow three cover crops, three multi-species cover crops a year for multiple years and harvest nothing, just return it all to the soil. Yeah. So that soil that's well below 1% in soil organic matter now, what will that look like in that time frame? And if there was a government program to actually accrue carbon, how much could we accrue? So if you then just said to a farmer here, I have carbon excesses, I want to do a carbon transfer payment that you capture what I'm personally burning and releasing. Um, and we paid that farmer to do that uh, just as a transfer payment. That farmer then could make some money on building the health of the system and drawing down out of the atmosphere at the same time. And then if he went back and, and turned that field in three to five years back into farming, he'd have a much more fertile, water cyclable, nutrient dense soil to grow the next crops where we need a lot less or no inputs. Yeah. And so we'd be helping everything, the cleanliness of the water, the atmosphere, um, you know, help each one of us to do that. And so if there were programs, those are the kinds of programs I like to see, but we have this field started and yeah. I want three years in there to see what difference is it not 10 tons? Is it 20 tons? What yeah. would it look like? <laughs> and that's what's exciting about the farm bill coming up next year and, you know, various energies being built around that. I mean, for those who do want to engage that, that sort of legislative realm, you know, um, you know, there's definitely a, a, an opportunity coming up in the next in the next year or so to yeah. to start proposing some of these things, right? I mean, yeah. it wouldn't be the end of the world to be using some of this data to tell stories around what we right. think the farm bill should be, and right. whichever way it goes, we can use it as an opportunity for people to be more aware and yeah, have sure. built the, uh, told the story more deeply. So, 
Yeah, um, Erica asked just a quick question about the fungal um, transition. How fast does that, you know, how much time does it take for the fungal dominance to establish? Measure? I don't know, but we saw it in two years. We didn't look at it at one year. We wouldn't have expected it. We didn't expect it in two years to go from bacterial dominant to fungal dominant. Holy smoke. That, that It may happen in one year, just like the earthworm showed up in 14 months at, and we didn't look at six months, but but we looked at it for, and go, holy smoke. So <laughs> how fast? We don't know, uh, but fast. I mean, really response. Nature just says, hey, I know how to do this. Just give me what I need and watch what will happen. Stop abusing me. Yeah, <laughs> right? sure. Just yeah. Let me, yeah, I got this. Right. I was going to say months, not not years. Yeah, yeah, I think maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, you will see a response in the very first year, no question. Will it move totally from bacterial to fungal? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. It's a continuum, anyways. It's just yeah, a. It is all, yeah. all, all, all context dependent. Yeah. All right. Um, we've got four minutes left in our in our scheduled time. Um, we've you know been rambling all, all over the place. Are there? Uh, any, any points you feel like you would like to make sure are, are made before our time is up or? Well, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share um, a passion, a concern, a commitment that I have. And I know that many people on this uh, uh, conversation today also share. Um, I invite you to join us in our research, you know, go online. Um, there's a, a website called Soil Carbon Accrual Project online um and maybe i can even bring it up um that you can go on to and, and read about, about that project are you going to share that dan on on uh it was you shared the slide as part of it but it's soil carbon project.org oh yeah i do think it's right at the bottom of that it is oh, and, yeah, right there's there's the website at the bottom um that Who's describes that it? major project that, that we're engaged in yeah. Uh, if you know people you want to put us in touch with uh, that might want to help fund this, I would really appreciate it. We're working very hard on that level. Um, and if there's any questions or thoughts that any of you have, I'm happy to respond uh, through emails if I can uh, in, in that question as well. So um, I, I guess that's it. I could go on on this topic for the next four hours and and not you know lose my energy around it. Um, <laughs> but I, but really to um, release you all from that. <laughs> I will uh, try and, and just close by extending my deep gratitude for your participation and thoughts today. Yeah, and I just want to, you know, uh, express my deep gratitude for all of your, your work and your life. I mean, you've been doing wonderful things for, for many years. And you know, every now and then uh, you come across somebody, you sort of, you hear their name, Tim LaSalle, Tim LaSalle, Tim LaSalle, and then you, and then you get to meet them and you're like, oh my God. And so, I don't know. I think I'm not sure as many people are familiar with you as as should be. I think if they were, you would be having much less of a difficult time getting your work funded. Um, you really have a, 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 a you know a deep a deep strategic mind and and great experience and wisdom. And I think it's just uh, people like you we need to be amplifying more. Um, so thank you for and I, I appreciate it. And and I remain in service to that work. But this is. This is all of our work for Earth. This is every yeah. one of us for Earth. And you have a lot to offer, and people should know who you are so they can connect with you to facilitate the greater good. Thank you. You're one of those mycelial nodes. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Yeah. All right. Thank all you. Right. Be well. Yeah. To everyone. All right. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.